Mickey Krimmel. Uh, I have run across uh, a user on various websites for years called Wikipedia. Uh, it's, it's one of those, you know, we just keep crossing paths and I finally ended up living in LA. Uh, I've heard about this thing she was doing called Neighbor Goods. I signed up, got, the, got all my tools up there. And then I was like, you know what? We live in the same city. We should maybe talk to each other. And then, again, when it came time to uh, find awesome women to fill some of the speaker slots, <laughs> uh, the lady parts, uh, uh, Mickey came to mind uh, very quickly. Um, so I'll leave it at that. There you go. <laughs> OK. Hi. All right, I have some props. So oh, by the way, if you guys aren't doing anything tonight, um, there's a roller derby bout. That I'm skating in later. Um, you should come. There's tickets available at the door. That's usually not the case. Um, it's right on Temple between Alvarado and Glendale. We can talk about that later. Anyway, so how many of you have a power drill? Raise your hand if you own a power drill. It's like 90% of you. Um, this is a smart crowd, but there's. You might already know this, but the the average power drill gets used for approximately 12 minutes in its entire lifetime. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, wow. it's 12 minutes before it ends up in a landfill. Um, so, so Neighbor Goods is a tool that sort of helps turn that dynamic around. Um, we connect people in local communities to share physical resources. So the idea is we give you a way to save money and resources and to meet your neighbor by sharing a power drill, sharing a lawnmower. Um, the question that people like to ask is, uh, you know, do you really need the power drill or do you need the hole in the wall? So we like to say that Neighbor Goods helps you get the hole in the wall. Um, so a few years ago, I was actually getting ready to go to Thailand, and I needed a backpack. And I was like, OK, yeah, I asked around to see if I could borrow one. You know, I, I do everything last minute, so I wasn't able to find one. And I ended up spending, this is about $240 for this backpack. And I knew I was only going to use it once. And I just felt like that was really inefficient. Um, so I started doing research, and I found out that that's true for most of the stuff we own. Um, I ran across that video. You might have seen it, The Story of Stuff. Um, super awesome. You should look it up if you haven't seen it. Um, I also found out that 80% um, of this stuff, it's called The Story of Stuff. It's really one of the best things on the internet. Um, so I found out that 80% of the stuff we own gets used less than once a month. So if you just think about your own house, or like what's in your closet, what's in your garage, I'm sure you would find, except for maybe you, because I've heard you say you don't want an apartment earlier. Um, so maybe you probably don't own a bunch of stuff. But uh, like 80% of the stuff you own, you never use. It just sits there collecting dust. Um, so so neighbor goods, you know, is meant to get more use out of that stuff. Um, so back when I started thinking about it, oh, oh, this is the other statistic I wanted to share with you. So um, according to the Self Storage Association, the fact that that even exists to me is hilarious, the self storage <laughs> Association. Yeah. <laughs> Americans spend $22 billion a year on self-storage space. It's a huge industry. There's enough self-storage space in this country for every man, woman, and child to have 7.5 square feet. That's like bigger than your arm span for every person in the country. It's insane. Um, so I started thinking about just the latent value hidden in all that stuff, right? And I started thinking about it, you know, financially. There's a lot of financial value. We buy these items, never use it again. But there's also social value in that <coughs> stuff. Um, it's an opportunity to, those, those objects are social objects. And we, you know, by sharing them, we create an opportunity to meet our neighbor, to build a trusting relationship. Um, by trusting them that they're going to return that object, that's how you build a real trusting relationship. So that's where the idea came from. Um, we launched nationally last summer. We're now the leading online resource for this kind of thing. It's a very new emerging market, so that doesn't mean we're huge. Um, but we're getting there. Um, we've been featured in the New York Times, Oprah Magazine. Uh, we were in Fast Company last week. Uh, there's definitely an emerging market now that's been called collaborative consumption is sort of what this whole space has been dubbed. And that's things like Airbnb, Zipcar, now Relay Rides, which is peer-to-peer -peer car rental, things like Neighbor Goods. Um, and, and it's it's very exciting time to be you know sort of in this emerging space. I and mean, when we started two years ago, there was it didn't exist, right? Now we have all these competitors, and we're grateful for that because you know honestly it means something's happening. Um, so that's exciting. Uh, this backpack I've actually lent out three times now. Uh, the very first time someone asked for it, it was right after the the, the earthquake in Haiti, and a friend of mine was going down there with an NGO to distribute food, and he wanted to use this backpack to carry the food around. And I was like, oh my god, like, 
Yeah, you know, this is why I made this site. Like, the, the, he ended up actually not even being able to pick it up because he had to get on a flight sooner than he thought. But the fact that it almost went to Haiti to help, like, food be distributed to people who need it instead of sitting in my closet collecting dust was just like that. That was why we built Neighbor Grits. Oh, sorry, my iPad died, and I need my notes. Um, okay. All right. So, at the risk of revealing our secrets, I want to share. Um, I don't really believe that. That's a joke. Um, I want to share <laughs> some of the things that we've learned so far uh, with Um uh, The main thing is um, sort of the, the difference and the incompatibility between financial reward and social reward. Um, so when we first launched Neighbor Goods, we thought, oh, this is obviously a marketplace, right? <laughs> There's all this wasted money. People are spending money on storage. You know, because when you think about launching a startup, you know, you're thinking about business, how we're going to monetize, blah, blah. Um, and so we launched this site, you know, I invited a thousand friends to try it out and, um, you know, the site initially did lending, borrowing, renting, selling, gifting. You could do whatever you wanted with the item within a local social network. Um, and we found that the free transactions outnumbered paid by eight to one and lending and borrowing was like by far and away the most common thing that people were doing with their items. And part of that has to do with the design. I mean, that was really the action we were trying to encourage. But I think part of it is also um, just the incompatibility of those two reward systems. Um, when you're trying to, you know, gain excess or, or earn money off of excess inventory, we have lots of tools to do that already. eBay, Craigslist, like Craigslist works great for selling things because when you're trying to earn money, you don't really care who you're selling it to. In fact, it's better to sell it to a stranger because none of us charge full price to our friends, right? When you're trying to earn money, when that's the driver, it's actually better if you don't know the person you're interacting with. When the driver is, I want to help someone, I want to hook you up, I have this thing I'm not using anyway, of course you can borrow my vacuum cleaner. It's actually more rewarding to do that for free than it is to earn $5. The $5 all of a sudden makes it feel like a chore. Right? You're like, oh shit, when are we going to meet? Do I, do, are you going to come to my house and I have to make sure I'm there? It feels like a total chore. If you're doing it because you want to help someone, that's the point. You want to be there when they come over because you want to have that conversation and you want to meet them and you want to strengthen your neighborhood. Um, I remember my first transaction on the site uh, was with this guy, Jory. You might know him. He's popular around the internet. Um, he came over in, in L.A. He's in this universe. I'm surprised he's not here today. But, um, so I borrowed a book from him and he came over and brought the book to my house. He lives in my neighborhood in Atwater Village, which I love. Um, and he brought avocados from his avocado tree along with the book. We'd never met before. We sat on my couch and we talked for 30 minutes about Atwater Village, about his family, the neighborhood. Since then, I'm like active in the neighborhood council. I'm like doing all this stuff I never thought I would do because we have this really strong network of people that met on neighbor goods. Um, and so, you know, I'm trying to recreate that neighborhood everywhere else. <laughs> um, okay. So yeah, we talked to our users over and over again, and, and this just, it kept coming back to us. We kept hearing that. Like, the stories they were telling us were not, I earned $10 today. We never hear that. No one ever, they don't care. We, we hear from people over and over and over again. I met my neighbor, you know, now they're babysitting my kid, or my kid met this kid because we borrowed something. And like, those are the stories we heard over and over again. And so that's what we're focusing on. Like, we, you can still rent, you can still set a deposit, but it's more as like a security measure, like if it's someone you don't know. You know, you don't list items for rent on neighbor goods. You just list, these are the things I'm willing to let people use, and then you decide the sort of parameters based on the conversation you have with that person. Uh, so we don't see ourselves as a marketplace at all. It's very much a local community. Um, we're actually seeing ourselves expanding into sort of services and time sharing also, because uh, we're starting to see people use our, our wish list that way. You have a wish list feature, so if you can't find something on the site, you can say, you know, I'm looking for a lawnmower or whatever. And we're seeing people say, you know, I need a ride to the airport or I need a babysitter. And so it's sort of guiding where we're going next is sort of this like neighborhood help center. You know, so you can log in and see like, you know, I have extra time on Saturday. Let me know if you need help with something or, you know, I'm trying to build a deck. Does anybody know how to do that? You know, help people sort of complete projects together and improve their neighborhood this is where we're going. Um, so... Oh yeah, and just like, uh, again, to further back that up, I'm, I know I'm belaboring this point, but it's really all, everything we're about. Um, there's a, 
I've been re researching the sort of like psychological research about this distinction between financial and uh, social reward. And there's like a famous example of the, they did a blood donor um, experiment where they had like, you know, group A and group B and they were all donating blood and they paid group A to, pay, to give blood and they didn't pay group B. And like group B gave like 50% more. Like they just, they, they did it because it felt good. Like as soon as they added the financial reward to the altruistic reward, it actually diminishes the feeling of having done good for somebody. Um, there's tons of tons of research about it. Okay, so I mean, you know, this is all philosophical hippie stuff, and we're just talking about vacuum cleaners and power drills. Um, so, <laughs> um, so you know, how can lending your lawnmower actually help build a safer, more connected community? It it really does. Um, so I actually want to do an experiment, and I need two volunteers, preferably who don't know each other. Are there two people here who don't know each other after this whole day? Okay, I have a gentleman back here, and this, do you two know each other? No. Awesome, come on now. <laughs> and I need, well, it would be better if you had a chair. Yeah, okay. That way you're not looking at each other. Okay, I'm not looking at him. No, it's okay if you do it right now. <laughs> Are you guys are each going to sit down and I don't care which chair you take? Alright. Now everyone else is going to be really bummed that you didn't volunteer because they're going to earn money. Cash money! Okay. Seriously, at the end of this experiment you guys get to keep whatever, whatever you're left with. Alright. So, one, two, three, four, five dollars for you. One, two, three, four, five dollars for you. Welcome. <laughs> okay. You could do that if you want. So A, B. All right? You're B. So now what's going to happen is I'm going to talk to person A over here, and I'm going to tell him that he doesn't have to give me anything, but whatever, whatever amount of money he gives to me, right, I'm going to triple it, and I'm going to take it to person B. Person B then has the option of sending back However much money she wants, it could be zero, five, whatever, it could be all of it, whatever she sends back, she's going to give that back, and I'm going to take it back to person A. And then that's it, that's the end. They both keep what they end up with at the end, right? So, let's see what happens. One, two, three, four, five. He gave me five dollars. I'm going to take that over to person B. Wait, let me triple that. Wait, I'm skipping a step. Okay, I just gave her $15. So now she has how much? 20. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so now how much of that would you like to send back to person A? And remember, after that, it's over. I know. Okay. <laughs> she lives in Boulder. <laughs> 20. That's all of it. So now person A just left out. <laughs> um, Okay, that's the end of the experiment. So, <laughs> hey, you just made 20 bucks. Yay! Just serious. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, so normally that person would be like, I'm going to keep half and send the other half back. Like, that's what happens most of the time. But it doesn't matter. It's not even the point. The point is, um, I mean, it, so this is this is a study. Do you guys know Paul Zak? He's a, he spoke at Mindshare recently. He does this study about oxytocin and the impact of oxytocin on our brains and how it um, creates a feeling of connectedness and trust. He's at Claremont University here in LA, so he speaks a lot locally. I figured you might know him, but um, so he does this experiment, and the, the goal it basically it's it's meant to. The way they do it is, you know, they're not in they're not in the same room and they're not being watched by a bunch of people and being live streamed on the internet. It's an anonymous thing and they're doing it via computer and so it's much more scientific than what we just did. Um, but the point is, um, it is ninety what did they say? Eighty five percent of person A, the first person, sent some money to person B in their experience. Eighty five percent. You don't have to. They don't know. They don't. You know what I mean? They they don't know if it's going to come back. I mean, it, it sort of makes more sense for person A to, to just keep it, right? Because they don't, they, if, they, if they don't, but they don't because they trust that person B is going to send some back. They trust that person B is going to have some sense of fairness and send some of that money back. And so 85% of them send it over. And then 98% of person B sends some back. 98. That's insane. Like, you, you have all the power in this seat over here, right? Like, you just had it all tripled. You got all the money. You have the most money anyone could possibly have in this experiment. 98% send some back. 
I think it's amazing. And, it, and, and, and the, so Paul Zach talks about, you know, oxytocin is chemical in the brain and how that, that builds trust and how, like, trust is innate and it's part of who we are. Um, and oxytocin is, is the same chemical that's excreted in your brain during uh, breastfeeding and orgasm. So it's like, it literally is the, the bonding chemical, the love chemical, the chemical that makes us feel like tribe, right? Um, and so, so the whole argument from him is, is that trust is actually the, the natural state and distrust is the unnatural state. That like our, our sort of consumer culture and our individualistic culture is what has taught us not to trust and that we're actually, we're actually meant to trust. Um, and so neighbor goods is, you know, again, it's just about power drills and lawnmowers, but in the end, it's really, I mean, what we're trying to do is to connect people to rebuild that sense of trust, to build a new kind of economy, a new kind of, you know, you don't really need to own the power drill, you need access to the power drill. I mean, that, so that, that's sort of what we're working on. And it's built in, in all of these ideals. Um, that's actually only 20 minutes, but I guess if you want to ask questions, or I don't know what, what. What's this one? Um, so I have a, maybe a sad question, which is, it seems so, it does seem like there is something about trust that is natural, but it also mm -hmm. seems like things like nationalism and religious enmity are, they seem yeah. baked into. Sure. Well, that's the, I mean, that's the, that's the, the tribal thing taken to the extreme, right? Um, I mean, so how do you reconcile the fact that we seem to have a, built, a baked in trust uh, instinct, but also a baked in distrust instinct when it comes to tribes, and, and dealing with that for what you're doing? Mm. That's an interesting question, I mean, because we, we use this sort of group mentality to build more trust on the site. Like we, we noticed that people that were members of groups on neighbor goods were sharing more actively within that group and people would ask for private groups. And so that's actually our sort of freemium feature. It, premium feature is the, is the private group. Um, I don't know that that's necessarily a problem for neighbor goods or that one that we can solve necessarily. I mean, although honestly, so if you come in, if you come in, you know, we're working a lot with groups and organizations. That's our business model. Someone's going to ask how we make money. Um, we work with groups and organizations. Um, and, and so they bring, you know, so if you sign up through your company's sharing group, um, we also ask you to choose your neighborhood, where you live, and so we kind of show you other people and groups nearby. So the hope is if you come in through your private insular group, then, you know, someone else is going to have something you need, and you're going to be like, oh, you know, and sort of expand beyond that. Um, but that part we haven't really thought about as philosophically as you asked the question. It's more just like, how can we make the network grow? Yeah, um, so I live in Portland, and um, just a few blocks from my house is the Northeast Portland Tool Library. Um, and it's essentially the same thing, people, but people donate their tools there, and you can come, it's open two days a week, you can come and take stuff for a week or whatever. And uh, so what I'm wondering, I guess, is that with, with your project, are there, is there like the flakiness of Craigslist involved? Because like with the tool library, it's, it's always like open at a regular time, you can go there and you have to return by this time. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah, you're still dependent upon the, the, the person holding up their end of the bargain, though, even in that scenario, which is true, I mean, on, on any of these sites. And I think that's actually what makes it valuable. Like, it's, it's the, the risk involved that, that gives you the opportunity to build a trusting relationship. If there were no risk, there can be no trust, right? The whole trust fall thing. If there's not the chance that you're going to fall, it doesn't mean anything when they catch you. Um, so our job is to is to give you the tools to, to mitigate the risk as much as possible. So, you know, you have an automated calendar, you say, what time are you coming? We'll send text message alerts. Like, we, make, we do everything to make the transaction as easy as possible, but in the end, I mean, it's fundamentally between those two people. Um, the advantage of our system, then, is, you know, you have the feedback and the reviews on the other end, like, this asshole didn't show up on time, or whatever. Okay. Um, you know, so, so, you know, you want other people to keep sharing with you, so, you know, it just incentivizes people to, to do well. I have a kind of a two-part question. The first one is, have you noticed that there is a difference in sharing behaviors based on the abundance or affluence of that community? And then the second one is, do you find that people are sharing outside of their own community, people they consider similar to themselves, or are they typically staying within their own clique? Yeah, it's a really, really good question. Um, and 
so, so our, our users do skew more affu affluent. Part of that is because we're new, and that's just who tries out new stuff. Um, uh, you know, I mean, our, our use base looks a lot like this crowd, except we actually skew female. Um, so um, there's actually a lot of research that shows uh, that communities that trust one another and that know one another actually do better economically. And, um, you know, chicken or egg, who knows? But um, right now, it's definitely, you know, we see most of our users are more in the sort of upper middle class. Um, we're doing a lot by working with cities directly to try and make it more available to others. Um, there's, there's, um, I don't know honestly that the the lower economic, uh, it's you know, there's the different demographics are are have different um, different <coughs> levels of comfort with technology and different levels of trust of technology. And so I think it might take some more time for us to be for everybody. We're not for everybody yet. Obviously, we want to, um, but. Yeah, I mean, part of it is just cultural, and, um, and we are seeing most people share within communities of, of similarity, honestly. Um, again, I don't know that that's a problem as we first start going, you know? I think as we build utility on the system and it becomes more like, I really need that item and this is the only person that has it or whatever, then, you know, it broadens that a bit. And I, like, I think we can help solve that problem by being really good at what we do. You know, we're not there yet. We're just so small, it's hard to tell. Um, but. Yeah, I mean, my hope is that the utility of the system will, will help solve that problem. Uh, how do you pay for this? All right, so it's a totally free service. Yeah. You don't, you're not skimming off the top. On no. The free yeah, we actually test. just won the Best Bootstrap <laughs> Startup Award at South by Southwest. We've done a lot with a very little bit of money. Uh, our team is really small. Uh, it's primarily myself. I have a community manager that also works here in LA. She's a student. I barely pay her. She's amazing. Um, and then my, my developer is in Texas. Um, He's not full-time, he works on other projects. And then we get additional development and design help um, when available. Uh, and so, you know, we just did a Kickstarter. Um, people, there's a there's an optional verification fee on the site, so if you guys are all on there, or if you're not, please sign up and verify, it's $4.99. It gives you access to more items on the network. We just, we send a card to your house, it verifies that you live in the neighborhood. Um, and then we're working with groups, organizations, and sponsors, honestly. Um, we have really interesting opportunities coming up right now. Um, so, you know, we'll sell to a, to a big organization, you know, a sort of custom group for their, you know, as sort of a company perk or whatever. Um, and then also with sponsors to help us roll out into new areas. As a, uh, okay. Uh, as a follow up to the, uh, the question about um, which, you know, what communities and sort of social strategy uh, are using uh, this service. Um, have you guys been working at all to bring it into um, mobile, and by mobile I mean beyond just like smartphones, but into like things like text messaging support to make it easier for people who maybe don't have a smartphone mm -hmm. and who are more rely on an SMS to sort of contribute to this, which would give you more of the ability to reach out to different communities? Certainly not yet. I mean, if, if, if this is going to succeed, we have to focus on our target market first, and our target market are the people who, want, who are more willing to use it, and the people who are more willing to use it are the more affluent people right now. Um, you know, if, if we get to that point where we're like, okay, now we can expand into new markets, then it makes a lot of sense to do that. But what we need to do now is make this kick ass for the people who want it, as opposed to trying to make people who don't don't want it want it. Do you know what I mean? Like we have to start in our target and then grow from there. Um, we are looking at mobile stuff. Obviously, everyone wants to be mobile. For us, it's 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 actually less about managing your inventory from your phone, and it's more about you know, the, the reminders, someone's coming over to pick up the vacuum or whatever, but also um, just, you know, to make it easier to add items to the inventory, whether it's a scanning barcode or taking a photo and uploading it. I mean, those are two things obviously we need to do that we don't do yet. Um, again, just because we lack the resources. Um, so y'all are coders if you want to help out. <laughs> what language um, are you, uh, what's it written in? It's actually, it's PHP, so you're all going to hate it, but, um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, We've had a conversation already. <laughs> um, yeah, so. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you.